Good morning, this is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. No rush to cut. Treasuries drop as the Fed's Christopher Waller says the US central bank should delay or slow the pace of interest rate cuts. In my view, it is appropriate to reduce the overall number of rate cuts or push them further into the future in response to the recent data. The S&P 500 gets a late day boost to finish at a record high. We'll take a closer look at how markets have fared so far this year as we head into the last major trading day of the quarter. Plus, intervention watch, the yen steadies with many traders now eyeing 152 per dollar as a possible trigger for officials to take action. Let's check in on these markets then. Fresh records across European stocks yesterday and the US. European stocks, three straight days of gains and European futures pointing to build on that. Despite the caution, as we said in the headlines that came through from Christopher Orla, he wants to see more data, at least a couple of months more data, to get the confidence before he is clear that there is an ability and there's a window to cut. The cautionary lines coming through then from the Fed's Chris Waller. And you saw that move across the yield curve. Yields up on the back of those comments. Those comments coming after the market close stateside. European futures then pointing against three tenths of a percent. The FTSE 100 edging closer to that 8,000 level, pointing high by five tenths of a percent. Commodities getting a bit of a lift so far in the session. S&P futures, you have the S&P closing above 5,200, a fresh record as we said yesterday. S&P futures currently flat. Nasdaq futures pointing at 18,500, also in pause territory, looking arguably for the next catalyst. That could come from the inflation data, of course, out tomorrow, or indeed Jay Powell and the speech that is expected to come through as part of the San Francisco Fed event. Cross asset, let's check in on the yield story then. Yields continue to move high, up four basis points at the front end. That's where the sensitivity has been to these comments from Chris Waller. 460 now on the two year. The Japanese yen, as we mentioned, still in focus for us, of course, as officials reiterate their determination to potentially intervene if the weakness continues. Bit of stability in the currency today, 151.38. Brent ticking higher, up four tenths of percent after a little bit of softness that we saw yesterday. $86 a barrel on Brent and gold, just below that 2,200 level per troy ounce up a tenth of a percent on the yellow metal. Let's get to those comments then. Fed's Reserve Governor Chris Waller saying the central bank should delay delay or reduce the number of rate cuts seen this year. Policymakers have penciled in three reductions, of course, with the dot plots. But Waller says a strong U.S. economy and robust hiring have given the Fed room to wait. In my view, it is appropriate to reduce the overall number of rate cuts or push them further into the future in response to the recent data. I see no rush in taking the step of beginning to ease monetary policy. Okay, for more on this, let's bring in Mark Granfield from Bloomberg's MLive team. Um, Mark, talk to us about the the market reaction then to these, what what seem to be at least on the surface, relatively hawkish comments from Chris Waller. Yeah, it was possibly exaggerated slightly because we are getting close to Easter and the markets are probably a little bit less liquid than usual. But certainly Treasuries took it pretty hard. It was no question that as soon as they heard those comments, there was a sell off across the Treasury curve. And as you mentioned, the two year took it particularly badly. And of course, it follows some relatively hawkish comments as well from Mr. Bostick just a couple of days ago. who He's only looking for one interest rate cut this year. So you can see the trend the way this is going and there's more. Fed speakers coming up in the next few days, as you say, Jerome Powell as well. But certainly there's quite a bit of pushback already. It was only last week that we had the FOMC. Everyone was very euphoric about the idea of rate cuts still being up three for this year. And there's a lot of dialing back in the meantime. And we're about to go into the second quarter. So certainly there's going to be a bit of a rethink here for investors. We've had these narratives which have been pretty clear for most of the first quarter. Equities are good. US dollar relatively strong and bonds have been a good play as well. And yet here we are on the cusp of going into the second quarter. And maybe people have to dial back on some of these ideas as they rethink what the Fed has to say. Of course, there's some very big data coming up over the next few days as well, including the PCE. So by the weekend, Mm. people have a lot to think about and they might not be quite so optimistic as they were just a few days ago. 
OK, and certainly we'll see if Jay Powell reiterates the line that he sees that they are not far from having the confidence to cut. That was a line, of course, that came out from Jay Powell a couple of weeks ago. You talk about the data, a lot of data then, of course, coming through from the US and Japan in the next couple of days. How are you looking at that and the tie-in to, to, do, to dollar yen? And have officials in Tokyo, have they got the pass now? There's a bit of stability. Have they done the work on that? Well, very interestingly, our colleagues in, in Japan, have they've been running a new Kanda index. Mr. Kanda is the chief foreign exchange guy at the Ministry of Finance. And they've been putting into context some of his things. Two major comments which he's been making in the last couple of months. One is about the yen moving by 10 uh, big figures. That's dollar yen, say, going from 140 to 150 over a short space of time. And a four percentage point move within two weeks. Now, putting that into the calculations, plus a few other things as well, they don't think that he's quite ready to pull the trigger on intervention yet. So dollar yen probably needs to go a little bit higher before we see that. Now, a big factor in, in 2022 when they intervened was the speed. Dollar yen was going up rapidly. For about three months in a row, we saw consecutive increases. It was going a bit too quickly, and so they had to do something about it. That hasn't been the case this time. The numbers are similar. We're, we're up at the near 152 level, which was a similar point, but we've got there more slowly. So maybe that's providing some comfort to the Japanese. On the other side, of course, they're not getting any help from the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve are possibly pushing back rate cuts a bit further. Short term rates in America are still above 5 percent. That doesn't help Japan very much when investors think the rate gap is so wide, so much in favor of the U.S. dollar. It's not really helping the Japanese yen. And that's not going to change for a while yet. So the factors against them are quite high. If they come in too early, it could all end up being a pretty much a non-event and traders won't be impressed. And that'll just cost them a lot more money when they need to get serious and really support the yen. OK, so the timing is going to be important. Bloomberg's Mark Cranfield, of course, from our M Live team. And we'll stay on those topics, setting us up really nicely for a check on the Asian markets with Avril Hong standing by in Singapore. Avril, what are you looking at? Yeah, we're looking at how Asia markets seem to be shrugging off those hawkish comments from Christopher Waller, even ahead of what we're going to get from U.S. data and Tokyo CPI. They seem to be taking things in their stride, uh, maybe because we already got those hawkish comments at the start of the week from Bostic. So for now, Chinese equities are reversing the losses from yesterday, leading the charge, Meituan, that is helping to boost the Hang Seng after it got its upgrade for the the outlook from stable to positive by Moody's. This is, of course, the Chinese food delivery giant. Now, let's take a look at what else is moving higher in the Asia-Pacific. <coughs> if you look at Honhai, that's the Taiwanese iPhone maker that also makes AI servers, is rallying to a record high, and it has been moving higher for this month. At the start of the month, we saw it posting those strong quarterly earnings, and between then and now, brokerages have been upgrading their price target for the stock. So that is among the lifts for the MSCI Asia Pacific today. But let's take a look at some of the drags as well. We have the ICBC BOCOM earnings. These are the Chinese state lenders and they have been showing those bad loan ratios rising. Increasingly, it looks like the property crisis is showing up on their balance sheets. We have a couple of others that are due today, including Bank of China, at Country Garden, the other one that we're watching as well, the troubled developer expected to show so deepening losses, stock ticking higher today, but it did close 8% down yesterday. Let's take a look at Japan cross assets as well. You were talking about the yen with Mark just a short while ago. We've actually seen it briefly spike on dollar yen to 1516. That was after the release of the BOJ summary of opinions for its March meeting. Yes, that's the one that they hiked rates for the first time after 17 years and then somehow managed to send the yen weaker. Uh, we're seeing it moving back towards that 1513 level now. Japan equities, this is a reversal from yesterday as companies are ex-dividend uh, today. So that is the drag that we're seeing on the APEC gauge today. Tom.
Avril Hong in Singapore with a check on those Asian markets. Thank you very much indeed. Let's stay on the Japan story then, because it has, of course, been one of the most consequential of this week. Japanese officials reiterating uh, that they won't rule out, will not rule out any options to deal with excessive moves in the yen. The currency then hitting, of course, a 34-year low on Wednesday, triggering warnings from the finance minister. And, of course, we had that unscheduled meeting of the nation's economic Authority. Standing by patiently for us has been Bloomberg's Japan Economy and Government Editor Paul Jackson. Paul, what do you make in the meeting yesterday? How it informs our understanding of officials and their appetite to intervene? What are you and the team looking for next? Uh, hey, I think the three-way meeting was something they probably would have liked to have kept in the back pocket uh, for a more extreme uh, scenario. Uh, but they've uh, already pulled that uh, uh, joker. Uh, and uh, maybe they had the uh, uh, Easter weekend in mind because uh, we're entering a period of uh, you know, low liquidity. That means that uh, any moves could be a bit sharper, there could be some, some nerves out there, and uh, a sharp movement could then uh, trigger uh, intervention or uh, a need or to, to consider that uh, factor. So uh, maybe that's why they pulled it out of the bag uh, late uh, uh, yesterday afternoon. Uh, it did have um, an impact. Uh, it's uh, lowered. We got down to about 151.03 1 uh, last night. Of course, it's uh, weakened again a, a bit uh, since then. Uh, but I think they've done enough for now. But the problem is, uh, now isn't a very long time when you're in a currency market uh, in this uh, situation. So um, I think we've already uh, heard mention of the data that's uh, coming through over the coming days. Uh, we've got the uh, uh, PC uh, uh, data in the US and inflation. That's obviously a, a key one that might shape expectations about the rate hikes. And there's also ISM data coming on uh, Monday. We've got Tokyo inflation uh, data tomorrow. There's thing that could uh, be a catalyst uh, for moving uh, the currency. Uh, I think one of the key things here is really it's all down to the expectations on when the Fed is going to cut those rates. And we've had those kind of hawkish comments uh, uh, overnight, which haven't uh, helped the situation for the Japanese policymakers. Now, if you look at how swaps were looking at a, a June rate cut uh, a month ago, uh, it was looking, uh, you know, odds on almost for that to happen. That's looking a lot less likely now. We've got talk of just one cut this year. And uh, hey, surprise, surprise, a month ago, uh, uh, dollar yen was about 149.9, something like that. Uh, so that shows the extent of which those expectations are shaping the dynamics of the currency market. Yeah. Indeed, you can almost picture officials in, in, in Tokyo with their head in their hands when they see these comments crossing uh, from, from Chris Waller and others on, on, the hawk, on the hawkish front. And you, of course, Paul, you've illustrated that, that tension, the gravitational pull back to the Fed and, and what it means. And you've also outlined for us that we had one of the most hawkish members of the Bank of Japan coming out and striking a relatively dovish tone early this week. In terms of our understanding of the next steps for the BOJ, with all the context of the Fed and the importance that that role plays, uh, is, is it baked in now that they are going to take this very slowly in terms of the further rate increase? Is that certainly the view from Goldman Sachs when we spoke to one of their strategists yesterday? Hey, I think this has always been the plan that uh, they, go, uh, they go slow, uh, they reassure, uh, they don't rush this. Uh, they spent more than a decade uh, on this grand experiment to generate <laughs> inflation. Uh, so uh, they, they don't want to mess it up. Uh, after all this time. So really it is a, a waiting game. And the key point here is whether uh, if the Fed uh, expectations of a rate cut really do get pushed back significantly um, uh, down to, to, to this one cut scenario uh, or, or even less, then, uh, then the BOJ might have to have a bit of a rethink, might come under, under a bit more mm. pressure uh, to bring uh, its next rate hike uh, uh, further forward. Uh, when would that be? Uh, expectations are now that uh, uh, the next rate hike will be by October. Uh, but uh, look, if those uh, Fed expectations really do get pushed back, mm -hmm. uh, then maybe we'll start to see uh, July emerging as the next possible timing. Interesting, really interesting, with the context there, of course, around the Japan story for us. Bloomberg's Japan economy and government editor, Paul Jackson, thank you very much indeed. Here's what else we're looking out for today. Here in the UK, 7 a.m. London time, finalised fourth quarter GDP. We'll look across that, of course, in terms of the health of the UK economy. 12.30 p.m. UK time, we're going to get initial jobless claims out of the US. And today, final 
Of course, it is the final major trading day of the quarter. Talking of Japan, Japanese stocks, the best performing major stock market, at least in this quarter, even as they face a bit of pressure today. Coming up, French media company Vivendi intensifies its pursuits of South African broadcaster Multichoice Group. We're going to have the latest on that potential $2.9 billion deal. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, South African billionaire Patrice Mosepe is in talks with Vivendi's Canal Plus to join its bid for the broadcaster multi-choice. Bloomberg understands the French media company is looking to make a formal offer early next month. For the details, let's bring in Bloomberg's Ondiro Ogunga, who joins us out of Johannesburg. Ondiro, what is the significance then of Patrice Mosepe joining this bid? It enables them to meet the stringent regulatory requirements in South Africa. There's something called a black economic um, empowerment affirmative action that requires that at least 25% of companies must be owned by black people. So Patrice coming on board helps them meet this requirement. It's also great for Patrice. It helps him diversify his wealth portfolio as this is started to be one of the biggest BEE deals in South Africa. We understand that Vivendi will be drafting a formal offer, sending it to multi-choice, 129 rand per share, valuing the total company at $2.9 billion. It's going to be considered by an independent board in the next two or three weeks. We'll know the outcome of these considerations. OK, and if the deal goes through then, what could it mean? What is the implications for, for Vivendi and, and, its, and its appetite for expansion uh, on the continent? It opens them up to the rest of Africa. They have a heavy concentration in Francophone Africa through Canal Plus. And so what it does is it opens them up to 50 African countries that MultiChoice operates in. They bring on board 8 million subscribers. MultiChoice brings on board 23 million. Together, they are hoping to build it up to 50 million, invest in local content and also sports. What they're also hoping is to take on global streaming giants like MultiChoice and Disney. And Showmax is the best avenue to do this because they are the leaders in streaming in Africa head of Netflix. Okay, Bloomberg's Ondira Ogunga in Joburg on a significant potential deal in the media space in Africa. Thank you very much indeed for uh, bringing us the details. Coming up with the consequences of the Baltimore bridge collapse set to roll on, we're going to discuss global supply chain shocks with the CFO of DHL Group. Few people have their finger on the pulse of global trade and supply chains more closely than Melanie Kreese of DHL. That interview is coming up. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now time for Terms of Trade. It is our weekly deep dive into globalisation. And earlier this week, of course, the 1.6 mile along Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore collapsed in a matter of seconds. But the consequences of a container ship crashing into the bridge are set to stretch for weeks. From cars to coal, the incident has added yet another disruption, another wrinkle to global trade, exposing the fragile nature of some of these supply chains. Very pleased to say I'm joined now by Melanie Kreese, the CFO of logistics company DHL Global, of course, one of the biggest logistics company globally, and someone, of course, in a company with a finger very much on the pulse of global trade and supply chains. Melanie, really appreciate your time. We're going to talk to you about interest rates. We want to get your views on what's happening in the Red Sea. We want to get your views in terms of how supply chains and trade is adjusting. But I do want to start on the Baltimore question, the disaster, of course, and what you and the team are seeing in terms of the the broader impacts are on supply chains. What, what so far, uh, relatively early days, but what, what is the data, what is your business telling you about the impact? Yeah, good morning uh, and thank you very much uh, for having me. 
Yeah, so I mean, of course, uh, the pictures uh, of the crash uh, are spectacular and uh, it is very sad that uh, lives were lost uh, in uh, the incident. In terms of direct impact now on trade, I mean, first of all, there uh, are the containers on the ship uh, which uh, caused uh, the accident. Uh, we have some containers on that ship, so we are first of all working with customers uh, to see how we can recoup those containers. Looking beyond the directly impacted ship, um, there were no container ships stuck in the harbor in Baltimore. And of course, incoming ships are now being rerouted. So the biggest impact uh, which is currently foreseen is uh, particularly on uh, vessels which uh, carry cars. Um, those are very specific ships, uh, roll on, roll off um, uh, uh, types of ships. Uh, and here one big ship is actually stuck in the harbor that will create a bottleneck. Uh, and there's also a tightness in capacity with those uh, specific vessel types. So with regard to the container part, um, mm. it's uh, probably going to be relatively limited in impact, uh, but it will have implications uh, for the automotive sector. Uh, interesting. How long do you expect those, those implications to last? Is it, is it possible to give a timeline around this, Melanie? Well, I think, I mean, generally, when you take a bigger um, uh, picture at uh, what is happening with regard to uh, supply chain disruptions, I mean, you already mentioned uh, in the intro uh, the Red Sea situation. Over the last years, we have seen profound shocks to supply chains um, under COVID, um, uh, with a, a ship stuck in the Suez Canal, now with the Red Sea situation. And yes, that always causes temporarily pressure points uh, to global supply chains. But we have also seen mm. that those supply chains are much more resilient than some expect on the first glance. There are always workarounds. And I think that is also where we as a logistics company are actively working with our customers to find solutions. When you look at the Red Sea situation, yes, when it happened um, uh, at the end of last year, uh, that of course caused delays. Um, but now the shipping lines have adjusted schedules, workarounds have been found, and goods are flowing again. So a short-term shock, mm. a disruption, is always a stressful situation for, a situ uh, for the system. But I think overall, the supply chains are so strong and connected and reliant that workarounds can be found normally in a relatively short time frame. What, what does that mean then for your outlook for, for freight rates, Melanie? Yes, I think as we always see, when there is a disruption and the supply demand balance uh, is out of back temporarily, that can lead uh, to short term spikes uh, in rates uh, that uh, sometimes leads to surcharges. Um, but uh, we will also see that over time things will normalize. So particularly with regard to the Red Sea situation, I really would not over exaggerate it. Yes, there is now a longer time around um, uh, the Cape um, uh, for ships um, that is leading to some extra costs that is increasing freight rates. Uh, but I don't think this is kind of like the medium term fundamental uh, uh, game changer. So shocks create mm. imbalances that leads to temporary uh, price uh, effects. Uh, but over time, uh, things then uh, tend to settle often much faster than what people expect. What, what is the broader global trade impulse looking like for you now? You say you're not seeing countries cutting off trade with their major trading partners. What, what, is, the, what is the trade impulse of this global economy now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and uh, I'm, uh, as a CFO, always inclined uh, to look for hard facts and data. And we just published um, the Global Connectedness Index uh, for 2024. And when you look at the connectedness of the world, um, we can first of all see that we are still at almost the peak of global connectedness. The peak year was 22, 23 has seen a bit of a step back. Uh, so I think it is wrong to say that uh, global connectedness uh, is uh, going backwards um, at fast pace. Of course, when you look at okay. the details, um, for example, at the very interesting relationship between US and China, here we do see that um, uh, the connectedness um, and uh, trade flows um, have taken a step back. Yet, even that is still one of the most connected mm -hmm. pairs globally. So things are changing, but it is not the fundamental okay. end of globalization, which some talk about. OK, Melody, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but fascinating insights. Really appreciate your time this morning. DHL's CFO, Melody Crace. Plenty to do more coming up. This is Bloomberg.
Good morning. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. I'm Tom McKenzie in London. These are the stories that set your agenda. No rush to cut. Treasuries drop as the Fed's Chris Waller says the US central bank should delay or slow the pace of interest rate cuts. In my view, it is appropriate to reduce the overall number of rate cuts or push them further into the future in response to the recent data. The S&P 500 gets a late day boost to finish at a record high. Yes, another record. We're going to take a closer look at how markets have fared so far this year as we head into the last major trading day of the quarter. Plus, intervention watch the end steadies with many traders now eyeing 152 per dollar as a possible trigger for officials to take action. Let's check in on these markets then after the fresh records that were notched across European and US stocks yesterday. European stocks, by the way, three straight days of gains and looking to add to that so far, at least according to these futures. If you check in on the European stocks, 50 futures looking to build on that with gains of three tenths of percent. FTSE 100 futures getting a bit of a lift from the upside that we're seeing in commodities this morning, up four tenths of percent. S&P futures, though, taking a bit of a pause on hold, arguably ahead of the data that comes out of the US and a speech from Jay Powell, the Fed chair, of course. Nasdaq futures currently just pointing lower, but a little under a tenth of percent at 18,493. Let's flip the board and look across asset. We did see a bit of a sell-off, of course, across U.S. Treasuries on the back of those comments from Chris Waller. He wants more data. He wants to wait a couple of months before he has that confidence. Arguably, he says you could push out those cuts further into the future. You're currently looking at the two-year at 460. That's a move higher of around four basis points at the front end. The Japanese yen continues, of course, to gain our interest on the intervention risks from Japanese officials. 151.34, 152 seems to be the line in the sand. Uh, that is the view from some, at least, when it comes to the Japanese yen and the weakness that's come through. Brent, $86 a barrel, bit of a gain there coming through in the session today after the softness yesterday on oil prices, up four tenths of percent so far in the session. Gold, just below 2,200, 2,197, just up a tenth of a percent. Let's take a closer look, though, at 2024's first quarter. It's been a pretty fascinating quarter. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta, of course, anchor on the Markets Today show, brings the context for us. And Kriti, the year so far has brought some currency surprises. It has. Well, surprises, but not so much surprises, right? It's a, it's a fairly easy story when you look at the Japanese yen, when you mm -hmm. look at the Swiss franc. These are the underperforming currencies that have created the basis of this carry trade that seems to kind of almost create a little bit of complacency in this market. It's so easy to grab yield in the FX space if if you're kind of going short the yen or short the Swiss franc. And that has been the theme, at least in this first quarter, despite the fact that we got that BOJ hike. We've now had an era of negative rates completely end. And yet we are still waiting for a lot of those cuts getting priced into some of the other G10 economies, Europe, right here in the UK, the United States as well, of course. But that isn't stopping this trade at all. And I think because the carry trade is so popular at the moment, FX ball is at a real low, and I think that has a real emphasis or puts a real emphasis on what the dollar does next and what U.S. assets do off the back of that. Talking of which, and your next answer is going to inform what I do with my pension, Britain, <laughs> so, so, be, so be warned. U.S. stocks, the dominance, does it continue? Well, I'm a journalist and not an investment advisor, so i got to say that first. But uh, the idea is that it will, and that's where the dollar story comes in. So hand <coughs> excuse me, handy, I'm getting so excited about the American markets. I can um, tell getting so handy because it's kind of an entrance or barrier of entry from international markets. To get to the, to the S&P 500, you have to buy the dollar first. To get to treasuries, you have to buy the dollar first. The problem is, do you do that if you have all of these cuts priced in or getting priced out of the market as you currently see? So when we talk about the stock story, the currency story almost arguably matters more, despite the fact that so much of the outperformance has been driven by the AI story. Largely, the concern around it, though, is that you're not seeing that breath. And that's really the, the, the key debate that you know well, does the breath even even matter when you see so much momentum. It feels like nobody's really hedging against the downside of it because everyone wants to get in. So the answer to your question is hmm. maybe stay tuned. Okay, and certainly JP Morgan uh, have their views on that, don't they? And we'll be discussing that in more detail on the Markets Today show. I am sure. Critty with a fantastic wrap of the first quarter and the currency moves and, of course, whether or not US dominance can continue across the stock space. Critty Gupta, thank you very much indeed. Anchor on the Markets Today show, which comes up, of course, and starts at 7 a.m. UK time. I'm joined now by Shaolin Chen, or Chen Shaolin, head of international at Crane Shares, who just come back from a trip to Asia. So we'll pivot there from the U.S. stock dominance. Uh, you've, been, you've been in mainland China, you've been in Hong Kong, you've been in Vietnam. What is the mood? It's beat my expectation marginally based hmm. on the investors' sentiments towards investing in China. All things are building up back 
the growth momentum happening in China. It's fascinating to see. We see asset manager, wealth manager onshore. We saw institu institutional investors and also professional investors all holistically. We also met with regulators in China yeah. uh, to communicate or exchange our feedbacks. Uh, of investors globally, how we see China as a market, as a capital market, how they should stay communicative to the market as a whole. The feedback is very well, well uh, received. How honest can you be in that feedback? I was very honest because mm -hmm. um, if we had a closed door discussion, we had very senior officials were in the meeting with us together with our CEO, John Crane, in the same meeting. It was three other people across the table. We were very open. He represents for U.S. investor. I based in London. I represent for the European investors. We told them we want you to be communicative. We don't disagree with policies or regulations mm -hmm. that could regulate the market better, but we don't want surprises. Do they understand that for some investors, China mm -hmm. has become uninvestable? Well, the first question, Tom, the official asked or posted to us, me and John, was how can we help? How can we help investors mm. to rebuild the confidence to reconsider China's investment? I am sure with that question, they understand the situation as one second. They really want to help. They really want to provide a very uh, pro-market environment, pro-investor environment in China. Okay, so how does that inform your investment decisions then? Uh, if you want exposure <laughs> to the Chinese market, do you do it mm -hmm. via mainland A shares? Do you do it via H shares? Or mm -hmm. do you do, do it via some European uh, mm -hmm. proxies like the luxury space, like autos? How are you playing that exposure if you want to get it to the Chinese market? At this juncture, with all the policy announced by the pol uh, Chinese policymaker, valuation, how attractive the Chinese stocks are today, mm -hmm. the liquidity, sufficient liquidity introduced by PBOC and also by all the Chinese policymakers, Satswa, at NPC, at China Development Forum, all those together, I would strongly think that Chinese stocks present more surprise on the upside than the other indirect play. There are plenty of plays in China happening today, such as consumer, mm -hmm. such as clean technology, such as EV, such as you know, uh, hydrogen technology. All those sectors are the key force. Is this, is this a follow the policy investment mm -hmm. thesis for China? <clears throat> in some ways, yes. The reason I say that is policy will stay very accommodative to those sectors I just discussed as one. They have made trillions of trillions of be available in the system for those sectors to come and take the credit, go and expand and grow. We're already seeing overcapacity mm -hmm. in things like clean tech, in things like EVs. It's mm -hmm. a major issue. It's going to become arguably a bigger issue as the, months, as the months go on. How do you invest along the policy lines then mm -hmm. that you've articulated for us yeah. without getting burnt by the kind of overcapacity uh, mm -hmm. story that we're starting to see. How do you avoid that? Mm -hmm. These companies in the EV, in the clean, they basically has did a very major step, which is internationalizing their business. That's why CBID is pushback. in London. They're facing pushback. They the Europeans are looking at they Chinese do. autos. The US has, has their own concerns. They do, but they continue to be accommodative, try to push things forward. That's why CBID is in the UK. NEO is in Netherlands. All these companies are coming out of mainland to do business internationally. At the end of the day, they will find a way to be more accommodative to local European laws and regulations mm -hmm. to make sure they can grab more market shares globally. How's the, what's the real estate crisis? Uh, how is that shaping up? Does, do, we, do we get to mm -hmm. the bottom of that this, this year? Are they going to resolve it this year? How long running is that pressure point going to be? Ideally, if you ask me, a lot of the real estate developers <clears throat> should declare bankruptcy. They're already bankrupt. Okay, the time they given to those real estate developers was for them to build the sold but not finished projects. I think this will be the year that they have to complete or they have given the time to complete all those projects. Once those done, it's very clear to local investors, those companies are bankrupt. Just let them be, declare the bankruptcy, let the pain get out of the systems. Real estate will not be the major drive force for China's economics going forward. Mm. The consolidation will still going on for a bit, but we do see the put has been put in place. For instance, reduced mortgage, restriction removed for buying the second or new home for certain cities. Price four start to stabilizing. So I say real estate sector is start to see the bottoming yeah. of consolidation. Ver not very finished. briefly, how do you factor in U.S. politics given the election in November? This is the biggest year. That's why in biggest election year in history. That's why at the NPC, National People's Congress, Chinese policy or Chinese Premier yeah. Li set the economic target around 5%. I think that's very conservative. It's factoring in all these challenges they face with U.S., also the uncertainties on the geopolitical issues. So I think they are prepared for, for 
for those okay. issues. Okay, they're, they're prepared for the politics and the pressure point. I could be coming more uh, heat, more heat from DC. Thank you very much indeed, Charlie Chen, head of international at Crane Shares. Now to some other stories making news this Thursday. Index provider F uh, FTSE Russell says Portugal will be added to a key government bond index, uh, but held off on a decision on South Korea and India for at least six more months. Portugal joins the FTSE World Government Bond Index from November. South Korea stays on the watch list for inclusion in the FTSE Global Bond Index, while India remains on watch to join the emerging market equivalent. Earnings at Jefferies rose in its fiscal first quarter on strength in capital markets and renewed activity in the investment banking business. The New York-based firm says revenue jumped 35% on improved debt and equity underwriting as concerns about inflation and interest rates started to stabilise. Amazon is investing an additional $2.75 billion in Anthropic, completing a deal it made last year to back the AI startup. As part of the deal, Anthropic will use Amazon's cloud services and its custom computer chips. Anthropic was formed by former OpenAI employees and offers a chatbot named Claude. And uh, an auto workers union says Stellantis plans to slash around 8% of its Italian workforce. The move to cut thousands of jobs comes just a few weeks after the company's CEO tried to defuse a clash with the Italian government over plans to move car production to lower cost countries. Stellantis declined to comment on the exact number of staff changes. And a new report says blockbuster obesity drug Zempic could be produced profitably for less than $5 a month. Denmark's Novo Nordisk charges almost $1,000 for the treatment in the US. The study, which was led by researchers at Yale, has increased calls for price cuts to medicines in the US. Novo points out it's invested billions in research and production. Coming up with Germany, set to partially legalise cannabis for personal use in the coming days. We're going to discuss the, the opportunities for the commercial markets. Ollie Crook is on the ground for us. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Now, Europe's largest medical cannabis market, Germany, is set to partially legalise cannabis for personal use from next week. Guess what? Shock horror. Bloomberg's Oliver Crook is at a medical marijuana growing and processing facility outside of Dresden and joins us now. Uh, what a challenge for you, Ollie, covering this story for us. Take us through what this law actually does, where you are and how that ties in to this story. Yeah, so Tom, let me set the scene a little bit because this may be a bit peculiar for the general Bloomberg audience, but we are in one of the grow houses for Demican, which is the only German independent producer of cannabis that can legally grow cannabis in Germany. Only three companies can do it. The other two are Canadian, and most of the market is imported because there are very strict laws on how much you can grow within Germany. So behind me is one of four grow rooms where they grow a literal ton of marijuana every single year to provide the medical market, and this new law is going to have implications for them. But first, let's deal with also the the sort of personal consumption uh, parts of the law, which comes into effect on Monday. Starting Monday, you can have 25 grams for personal use. You can grow three plants at home. Um, you can have 50 grams at home. But then July the 1st, they start these so-called cannabis clubs here in Germany, where you can have communal growing of 500 members that can furnish them for um, the, the members of that club. However, the longer term prize for this company and investors is the commercial use, the commercial selling directly to the public. And they're going to run some pilot programs of that at the end of the year that's governed by different municipalities. And for the medical sector here, again, they have a cap on growing one ton of cannabis every single year. That cap is removed starting Monday. So they're going to try to double their output here for what they sell, because this is really where they make the margin, not the stuff that they import. So if they're doubling the market, I mean, how big is the market then? If they're looking to double the output, how, how large potentially is, the, is, this, is this European market? Yeah, so Tom, listen, it's hard to get like precise figures on a lot of this stuff, but to put it in for, for to context for you, we're talking about one ton that is grown here annually. The estimates are for what the black market consumption is in Germany is closer to four or four and a half hundred tons, 
right? So there's a huge gap in the market for the eventual sort of legalization here. And we're talking about, and again, people are sort of comparing uh, Germany with some of the states in the United States where they've legalized. So the Curaleaf CEO and chairman was talking about Germany being worth maybe $10 billion in the coming years um, commercially. But when you look at the sort of European market, and if they were to get legalization across Europe and they kind of they overlaid what happened in Colorado across Europe, they're talking potentially about a quarter trillion dollar commercial market, right? So that is absolutely enormous. Again, that hinges on legalization happening elsewhere where there are sort of steps going in that direction, but no one has gone quite as far as Germany. What's interesting for Germany, Tom, because we spend our time talking about the German budget, is how it could affect the German budget, right? This has huge tax implications as well as savings from the sort of correctional facilities. And we had a, a professor and an economist from the Dusseldorf um, Institute for Competitive Economics that looked into this and actually broke this down, down to the euro figure that this could add legalization, full and commercial legalization, could add almost 5 billion euros to the German budget, which, you know, is again very much in the Bloomberg wheelhouse, Tom. You're keeping it firmly in the, in the Bloomberg wheelhouse, despite the temptations to take it other places. <laughs> Ollie Crook, excellent reporting there, firmly. the context around these changes uh, for Germany, what it could mean for the cannabis uh, market on the ground for us, continue, continue, continuing to cover this story for us uh, over uh, the next couple of hours. Ollie, thank you very much indeed. Time now for our Bloomberg Big Take of the day. The world's biggest banks, let's shift focus uh, quite significantly, the world's biggest banks are quietly hanging on to carbon-intensive clients because of what they see as unrealistic demands from regulators and civil society society and the threat to their fees. Joining me now is Bloomberg's Alistair Marsh, part of the team who's written out this Bloomberg Big Take. Alistair, it's been almost three years then since most banks made these kind of climate commitments. How much, how much real progress has been made? Well, in the real world, emissions have gone up mm -hmm. and banks continue to lend to fossil fuel clients. So you could draw your own conclusions that it's not been that uh, successful a project so far. But to be fair, it's finishedly complicated, this energy transition. It's multi-decade, it's multi-trillion. And it requires fundamental shifts to various sectors of the economy. So perhaps the expectations were a bit too high in the first place, but certainly banks could do a lot more. Talk to us about the expectations then yes. and how high those, those were and, and, and the pushback that we've, uh, we've been hearing from some bankers and how maybe it could be reset to be more realistic as we, as we still aim for these targets. Right, but if we roll back a couple of years ago, COP26 in Glasgow was the kind of the big coming out party, so to speak, for banks' climate consciousness. And at that moment, we heard there's $130 trillion of assets, a big wall of money ready to finance the energy transition. Well, it turns out that that $130 trillion is profit-seeking money, first and foremost, um, so that we're only going to finance the transition if there's money to be made from doing so. And also, a lot of that money was stuck in dirty industry in the first place. And therefore, to expect that banks would just sort of turn a blind eye to sort of fiduciary duty in this, the general way that they operate in terms of we were profit-seeking institutions, was perhaps a little bit naive. And I think there was some sort of over-projection on how much leverage banks actually have mm. to push their dirty clients. Now, that said, they do have, clearly, that as the allocators of capital, those who lend money into the, re into the economy, they do have levers to pull to push clients. And they have big lobbying wings in uh, Westminster and in D.C. to push um, more conducive yeah. policies. But I think there's just been a, a more of a... Uh, realization that banks and the private sector cannot do this on their own. There's more that governments need to do. But again, that, that yeah. said, most of the money for the transition, which is a five to ten trillion dollar price tag every year, will need to come from the private sector. Okay. So there does need there is a bit of a disconnect. And here. The, the, I mean, we've been hearing about the fr the frustration has has boiled up, and some of the colour that's woven into this great piece comes through from a banker at UBS. What are the details there? Yes. Yeah, so there's a banker at UBS. His name is Judson Berkey, and he essentially is their point man for all things sustainable finance regulation. And at a meeting in Tokyo of the Financial Stability Board, so they had the Fed representatives from the Fed, the ECB, various other kind of global regulators, he kind of let loose a little bit and said, hey guys, your expectations of us are totally out of whack. Not that banks shouldn't be participating in helping the economy to transition, but that we shouldn't be leading it. And in particular, he took, he took objection to a recent ECB paper that said that 90% of banks are misaligned with the 1.5 degree target of Paris. He said, well, of course we're misaligned. The real economy is on track for like three degrees. How, and how on earth could we, who finance the real economy, be aligned with 1.5? Mm. And so there's sort of disconnect of where we need to get to on climate, but actually the kind of the commercial imperative and sort of structures of the bank, they're kind of clashing at this point. And that kind of came to a head in that Tokyo meeting. Really interesting. Great piece of reporting. And also, of course, really, really uh, consequential in terms of how we get to these targets, if, if we ever do. Alistair, thank you very much thank indeed. You. Of course, Alistair Marsh on the Bloomberg Big Take today. There's plenty more coming up. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg.
our medium term forecast is actually for the yen to strengthen somewhat. I think over the next year or so, we think it should head back towards 140, uh, primarily driven by uh, the, the thoughts of, of the Fed easing further down the road and, and somewhat tighter uh, Japan policy. So, so we think that the, the, the medium term uh, picture would be for a slightly stronger yen. OK, that was Christopher Wilcox, Nomura's Head of Trading and Investment, speaking exclusively to Bloomberg earlier. We talk about the Japan story, we focus on the Japanese yen, and clearly a weaker yen has benefited, of course, Japanese stocks, given the impulse around exports for Japan. And Japan's market, for the context, year-to-date, over this quarter, has been the clear outperformer. That's the white line, the Japan, the Nikkei, of course, and the gains of around 20%. You compare that to the yellow line, that's the S&P, and then the laggards, the S&P, by the way, adding about 10%. Then the laggards of the CSI 300, China, of course, but also the FTSE 100 has not performed particularly well either. Certainly lagged the likes of the Nikkei and the SMP. Now, the question is whether that expansion in terms of the upside for Japanese stocks can continue if we are now in, as we are, a more positive rate environment in Japan. Goldman Sachs talking to us yesterday, they say, well, the BOJ are going to move gradually and they don't think that any modest moves higher in the yen, if that happens is going to derail the stock story for Japan. They're talking about corporate governments. They're talking about the earnings strength that comes through. So that at least is the view from Goldman Sachs. The outperformance from Nikkei, will it continue, is a key question going forward. Let's flip the board and have a look cross-asset, how the performance has shaped up then in the first quarter. Because it's worth noting the underperformance of the bond markets, and of course just in the last 24 hours or so, we've seen that again on the back of those comments coming through from Chris Waller. But the gains really coming through, of course, for the equities component within the asset class. Then there's the Bloomberg Dollar Index. And then on the downside, side are the bonds markets, of course, as well. So that's the shape. The commodities are they're in there as well today. The commodities are performing relatively well. But in terms of cross-asset, that is the picture. Again, the clear-out performance of equities. We're going to flip the board once again and have a, a little look at what's happening in the Cocoa story, because that's been uh, one of the headlines that has really uh, driven interest this week, with uh, Cocoa at one point crossing through, of course, $10,000. That has come off a little bit, but this is the equivalent in terms of what you could buy uh, for the equivalent of a ton of cocoa. We know the crop situation in West Africa is a challenge. That's pushing up prices. 4.4 ounces of gold for your ton of cocoa. 22 tons of soy. You could get a little bit of Bitcoin. You could get a little slice of Berkshire Hathaway. You could get three months of rent in New York on the back of that. 1.1 tons of copper. Just in terms of the context for that upside that's come through the pricing of cocoa, what you buy. Of course, as we lead up to Easter as well, complications maybe for your chocolate buying. There's plenty more coming up. Markets Today is next. We're going to be speaking to the CEO of Lloyd's of London and certainly what's been happening in terms of Baltimore is going to be a key question there. And the CEO of Wizz Air. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg. 